final session of the online lecture series on research methodology and academic writing hosted by the research and postgraduate department of english sri shankara college in collaboration with the college iqac today we have with us dr babu pk principal al shifa college of arts and science perindalmanna i now invite minsi our research scholar for the welcome address Minsi, please unmute yourself. Minsi. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Shri Devi, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Babu P K is an academician and educational administrator with more than three decades of experience in institution of higher education. He has headed the postgraduate department of English at K A H M Unity Women's College, Manjeri. for more than two decades before moving to ms mumbad college as a principal he has served in a number of administrative roles uh, dr babu is a member of academic council university of calicut member of advisory committee ugc hrdc university of calicut academic director benchmark international school theodore and chief editor of singularities journal his interests include teaching soft skill training faculty empowerment academic writing and english language coaching he is also a higher education consultant providing support in institution building quality upliftment and in readying them for assessment and accreditation currently he is the principal of al shifa college college of arts and science welcome sir thank you oh. thank you minsi after having navigated through the issues of research interdisciplinarity in approach ethics and philosophy of research we are all eagerly waiting for you sir on uh, the structure of a thesis over to you sir all right <clears throat> thank you uh, let me make sure that you can hear me can you Uh, clearly, am I am I audible? Yes, 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 sir. You are audible. Yes, sir. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the for the intro and thank you, Anjali, uh, Kairali, and rest of the team at uh, Sri Shankara College, Kaladi. When uh, Anjana rang me up some time back. uh to talk about this lecture series i thought i will talk on a topic which is believed to be relatively uh insignificant but unfortunately that happened to be a topic which was it was giving me a lot of trouble in terms of the articles i happen to review and in a couple of uh dissertations i have gone through and often i have i have seen people uh, struggle when they try to compose a research article a long essay or a thesis because they haven't attached as much significance as they should have to the a structuring part of it and this is why when me and kunamat they were designing a, an academic writing workshop of five day duration we have set apart considerable considerable time to give support in structuring their research writing that explains why i have chosen to talk about structuring the thesis goal as a tool before i move to my presentation i owe an apology i was expected to appear yesterday but because of certain unexpected developments i was not able to uh do that 
fortunately, uh, Kujamad, my friend, uh, agreed to switch places with me and uh, all was well at the end. I understood. I apologize to Anshana, Kailali, and the rest of the team the kind of trouble it might have put you uh, into. With that, I'll move to my uh, presentation. I'll talk for an hour as I was directed to, and afterwards I would take questions, uh, uh, questions, comments. Uh, I would listen to your part of the story too. In between, if you feel like sharing anything, please put it in the chat box. If it's of immediate uh, relevance, I'm sure that Kairali would remind me about it. All right. Well, let's go. Let me share my screen with you. I'm sure you can see my slide. Yes, sir. Yeah, all right. Thank you. I'm talking about structuring the uh, thesis for which I have fixed goal as a tool as, as part of the title. I would, I would talk about the, the title I have fixed and why I've decided to phrase it as goal as a tool uh, first. Whatever be the compulsions which have pushed us into research, we start off talking about the rationale for research. The rationale for research for some of us could be promotion. Some of us, it could be the UGC's directive, which says that everyone who uh, applies for the post of an assistant professor Sir, you've uh, muted yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about it. I was actually uh, pushing that box up so that I can put it in the full screen mode. Uh, uh, I hope it's fine now. Yes, sir. Yeah, right. Yeah. Let me let me talk about phrasing of my title, goal as a tool, and a connected to structure. For a lot of us, there will be a strong rationale for research. There must be a compelling reason why you have decided to take up research. And most of us would like to believe that we were driven by something which troubles us. We were driven by uh, and in a doubt, a query. We were driven by a passion to explore further a particular topic or our attachment to a, to a particular domain. It is possible that some of us are into research because of professional compulsions. Maybe to become an assistant professor, University Grants Commission has fixed uh, Dr. Hood, PhD ship is one of those entry level requirements. It could also be because your college management, your internal quality assurance cell, they're all after you so that a percentage of people with PhD will shoot up and your score would be higher. But ideally speaking, the rationale for research should be your passion towards the topic, your passion towards the topic, and one of those nagging questions at the, at the bottom of your mind regarding something you've been reading, something you've been following, and something you've been involving in. And this rationale is what actually leads you into that idea you're researching into. You have been reading Coleridge for a long time, and maybe you were thinking about uh, the kind of dreamy quality of his writing. You loved uh, reading 
let's say, uh, Shashi Tharoor and your interest in his idea of nation. You've increasingly listening to the kind of, the kind of probably a difficult vocabulary, difficult words that uh, Tharoor has a passion for and is, is so gifted to deal with. And you're curious about it and you decide to explore more about it. So an idea gets hold of you rather than you get hold of an idea. An idea gets hold of you and it drags you and you started following that idea. And this is actually the rationale which becomes uh, the tool in a sense of your research. It becomes a tool of your research because you are driven by inner compulsions which forces you to explore further and further about um, David Diop's concept of the war, his exploration of the other and the colored. Or maybe you are driven by uh, the writings of Arundhati Roy and how she explores the sense of justice, the idea of justice. And then the idea pushes you forward. You're driven by your rationale. You're driven by your idea. But you know that when you have to move into research as a formal activity, the manner comes into the picture, the manner in which you mean to do your research. So rather than your passion, rather than your goal, it becomes necessary that you structure your exploration. And this structure definitely will be couching the passion inside it. And the structure will be housing your rationale. And the structure will make you capable of putting forth a convincing line of argument that would justify your readers, that would justify the the members of the adjudication panel, and that would justify anyone who feel like going through your thesis. This is why I thought that the structure should be given at most significance. I'm sure that Dr. Kunyamad would have spoken a lot about uh, structure uh, yesterday, research yesterday. See, carrying on what I've been telling you, generally, research is joining a conversation. You've been reading a lot about football. You've been watching a lot of football. You've been watching football and listening to the commentary, reading articles, and listening to the, to the discussion on the, on the TV uh, during the interval, if you are tolerant enough to do that, and reading so much about it, listening so much about it, you think you have a question about football, a worthy research question. It could be something about the manner in which the football show is designed by the television studios. It could be the manner in which football is promoted as a, as a, as a brand and marketed for financial gains. And once you get involved in the conversation, interested in the conversation, you begin to listen to others who may have had similar kind of questions, not the same question, similar kind of questions. And when you listen to those who have gone through similar kind of questions, then you are into the review. You are listening to what others have said earlier. You're joining the conversation from the margins. But you have pushed yourself from the margin into the middle and you have started paying attention to the other conversations from different directions, the conversations coming from the experts in the area. And having listened to it long enough, having listened to it when you are satisfied with what's going on and when you are convinced that you have a say in the matter, you will begin to design and execute your own research. And you begin to design and execute your own research 
you are coming into the structuring part of it. And through that structure, you would draw your conclusion and you would, you would present your uh, findings. This is another quick recap of what happens in, in a kind of a research, whether you're talking about a minor research, which is involved in writing a research article or a slightly uh, longer form of research in, in an MPhil dissertation or in a full-fledged PhD dissertation. And when you do that, when you have, when you have designed a plan and when you move to coming to the conclusions and the stage of reporting your findings, you will be stuck with the question of structure. This is where my interests obviously lie. If you try to ask what exactly is meant by a structure, particularly in the context of research writing, academic writing, I would go for the simple conclusion that it, it, it means the author of ideas. How do you order your ideas in a thesis? What do you begin with? What do you pass through and what do you end with? It is a smooth, smooth, it's a kind of smoothness of progression you have, the flow of the idea from the beginning of the, of the thesis towards the end. And when you have a structure, a progression of the order of ideas from the beginning, it, it smoothens the progression of writing with similar points which are put together. The other day, I, I was reading a thesis, a PhD thesis. A friend of mine actually sent me that thesis and he was after me to spend some time on it. And he wanted me to go through the introduction part. The rest, he said he'll take care of. I delayed it because I was, I was sure that some kind of a gut feeling I had. If I go through the introduction, probably I will make certain suggestions which would force him to revisit the core chapters which come later. I went through the thesis and I realized that uh, I went through the introduction part of the thesis. Again, the core part of the introduction chapter of the thesis. And I spent half an hour talking to him, convincing him that he will have to overhaul the whole chapter. The problem was that the structure was singularly lacking in, I mean the chapter, I'm sorry, was singularly lacking in what you call a structure, what you call an order of uh, ideas uh, over there. There's so much about a particular kind of theory and uh, it, it was generously sprinkled in different parts of it. History was sprinkled in different parts of the chapter. And there was a kind of a chronological, uh, fragmented chronological flow too. So I couldn't get hang of the kind of uh, evolution of thought from the beginning of the chapter towards the end. Or in another way, there wasn't any kind of a smooth progression of uh, ideas orderly with similar points put uh, together. Structure is a key element of good academic writing. And at most significance should be attached to this aspect of the academic uh, writing. We often say that research starts with a research question. I told you that. You ask, why do we have a bunch of new generation Malayalam films? beginning to treat death in a flippant manner, in a non-serious manner. Is there a tendency in a series of movies in which death is, is treated a bit casually? And when you ask that question, somewhere at the back of your mind, you will have an answer to it also. You might be answering it assertively saying that yeah certain certain movies which 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 are of recent uh, origin recent make 
I feel that the theme of death is treated in, in a lighthearted fashion. So you come to the conclusion also that there is a tendency like that. So when you have a question, why, why is it so? Why do they treat it like that? Uh, why do they design uh, a football match like this? Why do they market it uh, so and so? Why are the lives of, of, of football celebrities treated in such a way when it gets translated into their biographies uh, later? So when you have a such question, you will have a hypothetical response to, those, to that question. In fact, it is this uh, hypothetical response to the question which would become the thesis of statement. A thesis statement which should obviously uh, feature the early part of the thesis. If it's a research article, it would come at the end of the, at the bottom of the opening paragraph or rather at the start of the second paragraph. The thesis I have been talking about the other day, it had the thesis statement coming on the ninth page of the introductory chapter, which for me uh, struggles to make uh, sense. In a 20 plus page chapter, that is a bit late for the thesis statement to make its appearance. So you have a question, you have a hypothetical apparent kind of an answer at the beginning, by the time you reach the end of your research, obviously you have a concrete kind of a thesis statement. And now talk about structure. The structure of the thesis supports the thesis statement because each part of the thesis contributes to the development of the argument which you have put into your thesis statement. It's not only that each part of the thesis contributes or should contribute to the development, the progression of the thesis or statement, it should organically, logically should contribute to it. And this contribution of each part of your thesis, each chapter, each uh, subsection in the chapter, each paragraph of your chapter will happen only if you have seriously uh, structured it. Often this doesn't happen because when you write a thesis, you get uh, expert advice on writing, which obviously promotes incremental writing which is a very good idea, rather than sitting down to write your thesis at the, at the end of the third year, uh, when the pressure is mounting on you, it's always advisable to write incrementally. So brick by brick, little by little, you can start building up your thesis. But the problem is that this uh, incremental approach to uh, incremental approach to writing your thesis should be based upon a structure you have developed earlier. Each, each paragraph you write or each cluster of paragraph you write on each day should contribute to a particular part of your project, your thesis idea. I'm trying to argue about the intimate connection that exists between this is question, this is statement, and this is structure. The structure contributes in, in, in a core fashion to the building of your argument. And often we use the terms outline and structure in the change here. It's okay, those two words could be used synonymously, even though generally we have a tendency to take the word outline rather casually, and we might take the word structure uh, more seriously. I would like outline to be taken as seriously as you take structure. Uh, this is why I have started off with the word 
uh, structure and then I, I am switching to the word outline so that you will be more comfortable uh, with it. Even though outline has a tinge of casualness uh, all about it, outline is serious activity for your research writing. Because when you try to work out a structure for your thesis, you have to work out an outline that best supports your argument and persuades the reader that the response is defensible. Your line of argument in your thesis should be built out in such a way that they should be capable of realizing that, well, there is a problem in which uh, perhaps death is represented in, in, in the bunch of movies you are uh, talking about. Because you have argued it out uh, responsibly, logically, and with a progression of ideas from the beginning through the middle uh, to the end. With supporting scholarship coming, evidence of your, your uh, broad reading uh, uh, reflecting in your thesis, and with uh, supporting arguments, original ideas of, of your own. So why an outline? Because it, it helps you structure and it, it supports your argument and it can persuade people to read through it uh, and, and realize that your, your, your response to the research question is actually uh, defensible. It's acceptable. This kind of a structure building uh, process, usually, as every one of you know, follows this kind of a pattern. You have a thesis which is uh, broken down into chapters, and a chapter or chapters which are constituted of paragraphs. I would like the thesis writing people to take paragraphs seriously and build up your chapter with responsible paragraphs and then make the chapters contribute to the whole body of your thesis. Academic writing should be taken seriously and I'm sure that all the, all the colleges which have got research departments will run an add-on program, at least an add-on program, of 30 hours duration, you can satisfy the requirements of uh, assessment and accreditation, and you can provide much needed writing skills and common sense for the research scholars. This is common enough structure, but deceptively uh, simple kind of a flow of ideas. Generally, if you, if you talk about structure, everyone knows that a thesis would carry the friend matter, then core chapters like introduction, core chapters, and conclusion, and the end matter. The friend matter constituting the certificates, including the plagiar anti plagiarism certificate, uh, the statements which come from your supervisor, content, so on and so forth, the acknowledgement, uh, you dedicating your thesis, so on and so forth. Then two, three, and four are actually chapters, but number three, the core chapters would be providing the thrust of the argument in favor of your thesis statement. Introduction and conclusion would be there. Obviously, uh, introduction is written towards the end and fixed at the beginning. And the end matter comes your references, book cited, bibliography, yeah, all those things would come towards up. Uh, end uh, of it. This is a typical structure most of us are definitely uh, aware uh, of. But when you dig deeper and go back to the question I asked earlier, why an outline? Often people start off with an outline of this kind. For instance, if you're talking about the comparison of two writers, which is very common, uh, comparative, uh, expositions through your uh, thesis. Uh, some of us would go for the, uh, the, the very simple kind of the option 
I mean, first you talk about the first writer, the second writer. Then if you're comparing the two writers based on two elements, maybe uh, a narrative flexibility is one element and uh, uh, metafictional technique is another one. Then you would compare uh, in, in terms of the narrative flexibility or flexibility in one and the metafictional techniques in the uh, second one. And then you may go for the conclusion. Simple kind of a, a structure and there's nothing, nothing wrong with uh, going for that kind of a simple structure. What matters is uh, how you have argued out your thesis when you move through these uh, chapters. When you design uh, a thesis, often maybe uh, towards some of some in certain colleges, I know that certain research centers, right at the beginning, even when you conceive your abstract, your serious kind of an abstract, you would start chapterization, which is a slightly novel kind of a uh, method. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, uh, uh, the chapterization was conceived uh, towards the kind of the middle of that after after a lot of reading has been done, after I have I've gone through a lot of reading, I have traveled through lots of hesitation, uncertainty, uh, a lot of sporadic reading related and unrelated to what I've, I've been exploring. And then towards the middle, the, the, the talk about the chapterization came. Some of us are practically are talking about the structuring the thesis early and some of us doing it quite early in the process. So how many core chapters can there be? It's a serious question you need to ask. And the structure, the outline of your thesis would be uh, eternally indebted to the serious decision you take over there. And afterwards, you would, you would ask, uh, what will each chapter deal with? I'm sorry about the missing question mark. So what will uh, each uh, chapter deal with? The trouble I have, have seen often is, uh, is related to not always the division into chapters. The division into chapters often, if not always, often fall into the rhythm. But much of the problems would happen inside the chapters. This is why you need to spend quality time exploring and discussing with your super supervisor what should go into each chapter, the content and the breakdown of that uh, chapter, which is important. That will definitely contribute so much to serious structuring uh, of, your, of your thesis. Why do you go for an outline? At the beginning itself, let me tell you, it helps you organize yourself. For example, when I'm giving a talk to you on a topic which I'm relatively familiar with, I, I definitely would prepare what should go into my presentation, what should go into each, each slide of uh, mine. So when you sit down and spend time in outlining your thesis, you are definitely uh, taking a look at inside your mind, connecting it with the kind of reading you have had, with the background uh, against the backdrop of the thesis statement you have framed. It helps you organize your thoughts. And only when you sit down to prepare an outline, you can be made aware of uh, certain gaps in the argument. Right. When I spoke to my friend about the, the introductory chapter I, I, I spoke to you at the beginning, he definitely realized that there is a problem of uh, a too many elements he has tried to cram the chapter with, too many examples he has come with, and excessive explanations he has is actually uh, filled pages uh, with. 
you can understand the flow of information and how ideas are related. For instance, uh, when you move from the beginning to the end and try to jot down your, uh, your thoughts, organize your thoughts, a paragraph or a section of a chapter or even a whole chapter is uh, bringing together related ideas. Chaos would be the result when you try to uh, put in non-related ideas into one uh, bunch. You, and you can also ensure that nothing is forgotten when you prepare an elaborate uh, outline. I'm not talking about a rigid kind of an outline which, which you would be carving on a piece of stone. I'm talking about a flexible outline. I'll talk about it later. So you can ensure that you haven't missed out on anything. And it can also serve as a preview to as, as an organization of your, of your thesis uh, later, the early outline which you prepare. The early outline which you prepare, the loose structure I'm talking about, uh, would be later edited and compressed so that you can turn it into chapters. And then those are the chapters as the architect will tell you when you design a house. I worked with an architect who told me that my plan cannot be changed. He gave me time to make changes and said afterwards, you cannot alter and you cannot go for an additional room. He said that would be impossible with that kind, my kind of a plan. Initially in the outline, we are flexible enough. Later, when you design it into chapters and break it down into segments and sub-segments there, it's advisable not to play around uh, again. So that will also make your thesis a coherent, uh, unified uh, piece of argument, a coherent text. And when you, when you, when you create an outline, obviously you arrange everything in a logical order. Sense of order is very, very important. I was telling you about it right from the beginning, correct? Sense of an order. Otherwise, what happens is you talk about the uh, evolution of, of uh, writing of William County, right? And in between, you go back and you will write about empire a lot. Uh, then uh, you would come back and talk about uh, Britain, history of British literature and the contemporaries of County. And then you would go back and write about empire again, all right? Then you would remember that, all right, you, you are talking not only about Galting, you are also talking about Conrad, and then Conrad would come in. This kind of a zigzag fractured uh, movement would upset your sequencing. So jot down your headings, organize your uh, ideas and, and knots under relevant headings. And when you go for the free writing kind of an outline, you write down everything. That's what free writing is. You, you jot down everything which comes across your mind. And later you begin to order, chunk those on the headings and subheadings. And obviously related sequence of thoughts will go together. And when you do that, always try to, try to avoid long list of the subtopics. Because whenever you have a long list of subtopics, that would lead to uh, loose and messy kind of structures. Try to uh, avoid uh, such a possibility. Subtopics are necessary. You need subtopics to support your major points and arguments. But too much of subtopics would, would give you too broad, a, too broad an outline you'll be breaking too broad a piece of ground and you may not have much of a building to erect at a later stage. This is where the uh, trouble lies. And when you prepare an outline, take it as a working draft. This is why I said, when you go for an outline, when you structure your arguments, you don't have to take it as God given, God given like a kind of fatwa dropped from above, all right? It's a working draft. You can revise and edit. 
as you move ahead. But still the problem is we need some kind of a, a rigidity uh, within that looseness. If you take the, the working draft as too much of a working and too much of a draft, then the problem is at the back of your mind, you will be always thinking that but this is something I can, I can always rework. And you would end up reworking too much. And towards the end of it, you may not have any kind of a plan to start uh, working seriously. It is a working draft, but there should be some kind of, of a core stability inside the, the fluidity we are, we are talking about. Otherwise, it will be too fluid and you would end up running around when you have come to the writing stage of your, of your thesis. You can revise and edit, as I said. You can revise the outline after a couple of couple of days again. Uh, all right. Uh, I said you can revise after a after a couple of days because we want some rethink, some introspection to get into the process. Some some of the later thoughts, rethinks would would help you to make profitable changes into the outline we have created. This is why it is advisable for you to prepare a plan, put it in the freezer, take it out after a couple of days, and ask yourself, is this the kind of structure you would like to go ahead with? Or are you going to make changes? It takes time for you to sleep on it, think about it, and, and make final touches towards the end. And if you still think this is, is great, it sounds fine, can go ahead. But if you think that a revision is called for, then you must go for the revision, provided the revising is justified. Provided the re re revision addresses the lacunae. Provided the revision helps you surgically remove a lot of unnecessary flat, which could have cracked into the thesis at a later stage. That kind of a revision is is advanced. It's something you can always uh, think about go forward. The question can be what happens if if you go for, for an unstructured uh, thesis or writing? As I reminded uh, earlier, lots of unrelated points would creep into your thesis which would cost you time, energy. If you're talking about, for example, the, the treatment of uh, beauty or the treatment of beauty and fear, beauty and terror in a particular uh, writer, you have to decide how are you going to explore it? Uh, uh, which theory is going to uh, turn a light on that. Which framework, which theoretical framework are you going to uh, use? You need to be sure about it, or you will end up reading so much. And often what happens is, this is quite interesting, often what happens is you have read an interesting book. So you would like to make a mention of that book in the thesis. You are itching to quote from that book, even though somewhere at the back of your mind, you are sure that the book you have read in the final scheme of things, that book has got nothing to do with the thesis as you are planning to write it. Or an interesting passage you have come across somewhere. Uh, you are itching to put it into your, uh, into your thesis, which you should not do. If you have done so much of reading, in a particular area in which in the final analysis you come to believe that will not be of much usage, what you can do is turn it into another research publication, turn it into a research article, turn it into a couple of research articles. You can. You can cut out a chunk of your chapter and that chapter can be two research articles. Why not? It's possible. So if it's unrelated 
That's what I'm driving home. If it's unrelated, remove it. If it's unstructured, so much fat would creep into it, right? And it can also lead to confusion for uh, the, the evaluator if, if someone is evaluating your thesis and the, 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 the expert has come to the conclusion that, okay, this person is uh, uh, exploring the, the, the treatment of, uh, let us say, uncertainty in the poetry of this poet. The treatment of uh, uncertainty, ambiguity. How does ambiguity function as a, as a structural component in the poetics of this author? And this is the way in which the person who is assessing the thesis will be moving. But then you would bring in unnecessary elements into it, and that would definitely succeed in confusing the rhythm of reading of the evaluator or anyone uh, who reads your thesis. And obviously the focus would go up in smoke. There won't be any, any um, focus at all. And repetition, which is a very irritating element that come across. The, the thesis that I'm speaking about, which came from uh, someone I know, had the same line of argument, same passage, a similar explanation appearing in three places. I asked him to cut out 10 pages from it. It was kind of 35 plus pages, I think, around 40. I said, take away 10 pages of that because it deals with repeated stuff. It deals with uh, unnecessary, out of focus uh, materials and quotations. Right? And it, it, it can also send a message to the evaluator that you're not prepared for the thesis. You have limited uh, thoughts on the topic. This is what uh, unstructured thesis uh, uh, signifies. And that is that is why the thread of the uh, of the assessment will be broken and you will lose in comments or grades. By comments, I mean uh, probably your assessor was all set to give an excellent comment about your thesis in the report. But the kind of elements I have spoken about could, could irritate the person and would end up making uh, certain comments, which will uh, run against your grades there, which probably will make it go for another evaluation or a rewrite. So please do not uh, think about it. And when you talk about creating a structure through outline, I would recommend any kind of outline. Any kind of outline is better than no outline, number one. At the second stage, you will come to a refined form of a structure on which the foundations of your, of your chapters will be built. For example, you can think of a jolted outline. Which is, which is simply the sketch of an outline. And in the sketch, you're providing the major points you would like to cover. It can perhaps sound like a glorified glossary list kind of, a, of an outline, but which is fine, still fine. It's better than not having an outline at all. Some outline better than no outline policy. This is what I'm uh, advocating a list of major points you would like to cover, right? And this will help you to organize the similar points under one subsection, similar points under maybe one chapter or one part, even sometimes in one paragraph. This is why even a simple jotted outline like this, uh, I've taken a very neutral kind of an example. If your thesis is simply arguing that cigarette smoking it's not a literature kind of an example, creates problems for the public and that it should be outlawed. It's already outlawed. You can say, uh, I saw uh, an article like how uh, 
Twitter messages are creating problems. Okay. So you're saying that it's bad for health. It, 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 it results in safety problems. It can create sanitation issues and then you can build. Even, even if you have a simple jolted outline of this kind, where you're talking about it, it is harmful for health. Talk about how does it affect circulatory system or lungs? It it causes a safety problem. Fire can destroy property, or it can it can be creating un, un, unpleasant odors and soiling uh, your possessions. Whatever it it gives you a structure, and you have to write about only that one paragraph about lung disease. Maybe one about circulatory disease, another one about property destruction. Next about files, the, the soiling, then about the order, then the conclusion. It does have a flow from the beginning to the end. This is the advantage, right? You can even think about a working outline and working outline related to the outline we have spoken earlier, jotted. This is more fully fleshed out than a jotted outline. And here you can expand your argument, your thesis statement into topics and subtopics. The major points, the subheads, the details, and maybe the more specific details. That also is moving from the, the general into the particular, it can, it can flow. That, that would again help you, if you, even if you go for something like a working uh, outline. I, I, I knew one, one, uh, one particular research supervisor who asked his uh, scholars to prepare detailed outline that is unbelievably detailed. And it takes such a lot of trouble to prepare one it's like uh, first chapter one, then second chapter two, third three, fourth four, fifth five. Then you have 1.1, first uh, uh, major point, 1.2, second major point. 1.2.1 is the first sub point of the first major point. Then 1.2.1.1, this will be the uh, uh, detail. Then 1.2.1.1.1 will be the worst more specific detail. Even though it is elaborate and difficult and, and, and a bit of a stress to work it out, when you work that kind of, of an outline and begin to begin to spend time on it, it's quite interesting for you to fill it up with flesh here and there. You can place your quotes in the right way, right? You can bring in the supporting quotations there. You can bring in supporting primary codes and supporting secondary codes into it. You can bring in examples there. You can bring details uh, into it. This is this is quite elaborate, but it's such a plan which, which you only have to fill in later in the light of the scholarship of the reading you have done on the topic in your domain. So the first part of it will be difficult but the later part, of course, will be will be easy. That's just uh, a sample. There is also something called argument map. Argument map I found interesting because the thesis argument uh, of map. For example, if you're talking about a chapter, you will write a chapter title, and then you would give the the broad purpose of that chapter. What is it you are planning to achieve with that particular chapter. Then what is the argument of that chapter? Then that set chapter would be would be broken down into certain sections. And you would talk about what each of those sections will argue. And if the section is equivalent to a paragraph, you will be stating that the first paragraph will argue this. Second paragraph would argue this, and third paragraph would argue this with uh, a plan. You have a, a table, a plan you have created like this. 
Like the example I have mentioned earlier, the advantage here is that in each paragraph, it's clearly spelled out what is it you need to argue and what is it you need to conclude at the end of it. This is the beauty of this kind of an architecture given to the argument of map. In a sense, I, I, I thought uh, the research scholars can go for a combination of what I've mentioned earlier uh, as, uh, which was uh, earlier given as a working outline. And maybe the working outline can be married to the argument map. So you have an outline in which what, what, what each section of your chapter will deal with can be argued out. That gives a beautiful flow to your arguments in the thesis. And it will be such a pleasure for, for those who assess the thesis to go through that. This is, this is what we need to achieve through our structures, right? In chapterization, as I mentioned earlier, I'll quickly remind again, think about the logical order in which the chapters are placed, because sometimes the chapters, even the order of the chapters are jumbled a little bit. What should be the first chapter might come as a second chapter. That should not be, right? It should, it should reflect the, the progress of the theme of the thesis. And don't put too many chapters into it. That would contribute to uh, fatty writing, and that would take away your time and others' time in the process. Right, <clears throat> this, this is just uh, another way of repeating what I said, outlining it, deciding what should go into it, and importantly, what will each paragraph deal with? <clears throat> For instance, if you're talking about maybe a thesis on Orhan Pamuk, and maybe the thesis is exploring space in Orhan Pamuk, uh, introduction, maybe you're talking about the idea of space, concept of space, evolution of the concept briefly, and the contemporary theory of space, and obviously you have the freedom to uh, put a frame, impose a frame on the theories and decide which are the theories you're going to focus on, which are the theories you'll be focusing on. Are you going to talk about the, the, the theory of every, uh, every day, or are you going to focus on uh, the theory of some uh, other writers who have contributed to the concept of space? Then you would come down to Pamuk. Pamuk uh, makes use of the space. What role does space play? Then maybe in the next chapter, you're talking about my name is Red, Artful Spaces, uh, Snow, Spatial uh, Politics. Then the next one, Museum of uh, Innocence, Self is Space, and Conclusion, uh, Strangers in Minds. We are, we are playing around with a theme, of, theme called Space Related Theme and some of the titles of uh, Pamuk's works. But then, the, 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 the crux of the matter is how do you develop, for example, a chapter titled uh, Special Politics? How do you structure that? That is what I would ask you to spend more time uh, on. Please also pay attention to the significance uh, of, of the titles, because titles can meaningfully uh, reflect the drift of the argument in a particular chapter. Usually problems are uh, people going for fanciful titles, which sounds big, but thematically it can sound hollow. It might serve a cosmetic function, but it may not have, uh, it may not reflect what is it you're trying to communicate over there. We need titles and subtitles uh, which can contribute to what is your argument in a given chapter. Similarly, for subtitles too, subtitles often serve as signposts because when, when, when you are giving subtitles, it would give an idea, particularly for those who are uh, reading the thesis to judge the thesis, to evaluate it, 
like which which are the subcategories you are looking at it would also give them an idea that okay uh, this researcher has categorized theses into these areas and they would know whether that quickly know whether that makes sense or not it should make sense okay and uh the the the, the title reflects the structure of your argument and as I said, subtitles are two. Structuring a paragraph, I'll, I'll mention that also. This is a very serious area to which research scholars should pay attention. We come across lots of paragraphs which are messy, chaotic. All of you know, and if you have, if you have learned academic writing as part of your degree curriculum you would know that a paragraph will carry a topic sentence supporting sentences and concluding sentence if you ask what is a paragraph the simple answer is a paragraph is a series of related sentences sentences which are related to a central idea so a paragraph is made up of a series of sentences related to central idea trying to add uh, more and more supporting arguments explanations examples to prove the topic sentence so you should try to add one idea at a time your broader argument, which means do not mess up your paragraphs with too many ideas. The best thing, the best thing, uh, the, the best thing I, I, I always suggest uh, is that The best thing I suggest is that one paragraph should carry only one idea. That is an ideal scenario, right? And if you would like, uh, sometimes if you're afraid that the paragraph is looking too long, then you should look for reasons to split it into two. A uh, too short para. I recently got a research article in which Many paragraphs were three sentences to four sentences long. I don't have to tell you that. I've sent it back for review, which because it couldn't be accepted uh, as such. And if you structure your paragraph, if your paragraphs are structured, as they say, if you take your paragraphs, then your chapter will take care of itself. It helps build meaningful interaction. Uh, integration for the uh, whole of it. So with that, uh, I come uh, to the end of my uh, one hour uh, presentation. And uh, if, if you have uh, questions or uh, comments related to me, and if I'm capable of answering those, uh, we will go into that. So, uh, currently, uh, we can see if there are if there are questions. Yes, sir. So far, none. But we wait yeah. till the end of the session. Yeah, so sure. Over, we'll just wait for a while. Yeah, sure. Participants, please, uh, please feel free to unmute yourselves and ask your questions. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, good evening. You're audible, please. Sir, thank you so much for a wonderful session. My question may be a bit silly for you. Sorry for that. That's okay. I, I have, have handled an apparently silly topic. 
Thank you. Thank you for motivating me. When we are reading something related to trauma literature, and I have an affinity towards Indian life writings. Okay. So when we look at it, there are 44 and life writings. And how can I outline that? As Sir has said that when we are doing two life writings and then we are doing a comparative study, I want to, my hypothetical statement is that whenever we are having a trauma, it definitely has a kind of change in the identity of a person. And unlike Sigmund Freud, who has said that maybe that trauma is having a kind of tremendous impact on us. And there is Kathy Karuth who said that, no, it can have a kind of change, total change in the identity. So I want to think more deeply into it. So how can I outline that? That is my confusion right now. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, your question is about when you have done massive amount of reading into a topic, uh, how, how, how do you compress that into an outline? Okay. See, uh, I, I hope my, uh, that, is your, that is what you have asked, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Oh, thank you. Uh, see, uh, when I spoke about two writers, I was talking about a simple example which you can easily comprehend. If you are interested in life writing and uh, if you are if you are looking at the looking at it from a trauma related perspective, uh, you you need to compress the, the reading you have done from the perspective of the structure of your argument. I'm sure that you will not be focusing on the, the whole lot of Indian writers you have read about, all right? Your focus will be on a particular aspect, as you said. Exactly. Yeah. So based on the, the, the aspect, uh, uh, aspect you are looking into, you have to decide how you need to structure it. Okay. All right. So when you outline it, maybe you, you, you are looking at it, uh, you, you spoke about some kind of your hypothesis over there. Am I right? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, can you repeat that? Uh, when I was reading uh, Sigmund Freud uh, and his theories, he has said that whenever we are having a, experiencing a trauma, it's a disruptive emotion. So this okay. disruptive right. emo emotion can occur to us in all our lifetime without our conscious you know, knowledge. So he says that there is a deliberate breaking of a person's identity. Whereas Kathy Karyuth in, in her studies in 1990, she says that it is not totally so. If it happens like that, yes, this disruptive emotion can occur in between and in between, that can create a kind of hysteria. Sometimes we ourselves won't be knowing why we are responding too much for a situation that is very casual. So, yeah. but she says positively that, but it <laughs> represents a kind of identity change where we can say kind of evolution happening to us in a positive way. So my hypothesis is that all traumas are not a tragedy end but it has a positivity. <laughs> that is what it's very <laughs> yeah, All right, yeah. Uh, Sai Parvati, I'm not getting uh, into the finer aspects of your argument because it depends on what, what is your thesis statement. Yes. Okay. When you give uh, an abstract, there will be a thesis statement in which you are uh, hypothetically beginning to explore something, right? Yes. And uh, you will have to ground your argument there. Of, of course, it's possible that you started off uh, in one direction and you might get a bit lost in the middle sometimes in the process of our research. Uh, in, in spite of what Karuth has said, or again Freud, Freud has said, what matters is how have the, the inputs which come from scholars like Freud or again Karuth and all, how far that will contribute to uh, your perspective on it, your line of inquiry. Okay. Okay, Thank you. That, is, that is what you'll have to look at. Sir. Okay, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much.
Um, sir, in the chat box, uh, Sudeeksha S. Pai has uh, said, uh, good evening, sir. It was a very informative session. I have a question that while structuring an outline, should we concentrate on the findings? Uh, Sudeeksha, uh, when you outline uh, the structure for a, either for a research paper uh, or uh, for your thesis at any level, your findings obviously or your apparent findings will be reflected in the thesis statement. As I said, you start off with a question, all right? And when you start off with a question, you have an obvious answer uh, to it. And then you're reading the review and understanding the domain so that you need to know what are the other voices uh, playing around related to the same uh, topic. And that's how you come to your findings. And of course, when you structure your outline, you have to give serious uh, attention to the uh, to the findings because as i said uh, certain micro findings will be there in each paragraph and these micro findings contribute to the major findings of a particular chapter and our chapter findings together will contribute to your thesis then there is an interesting thing uh, they say you can do, which is this. You take all the topic sentences of all your paragraphs, provided each paragraph is constructed around a topic sentence. Okay? You take all the topic sentences from all paragraphs, right from the first paragraph to the last paragraph in a chapter. Put it all together read and see what happens. Technically, that should be the solid argument flowing from the beginning to the end of that whole chapter. The same thing you can do for the, uh, for the whole uh, thesis. And if you have got all your topic sentences spot on, see how, how uh, interesting that text will be. All the topic sentences of all your paragraphs put together from the opening chapter to the end. More interesting will be all the conclusions taken from uh, all the paragraphs put together. So coming back, uh, while structuring an outline, uh, you have to give importance to the uh, findings because it is an outline you're going to build and expand at a, at a later stage. Thank you. Moving on, Tanya Chatterjee has a question. Uh, uh, what would your valuable tips for a, a final year anxious students who will be soon writing their thesis? I'm sure that Tanya is talking about uh, a PG, a master thesis. Am I right? Or a UG thesis? Tanya, would you like to clarify? Okay. And she's talking about the uh, writer's block. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, see, see, Tanya, writing is very challenging kind of a thing. It's difficult. Most of us struggle with it. Whether you are a degree student, a PhD student, or a thesis writing person, or a faculty member, or a senior faculty member like me, writing doesn't come easy. It's difficult. And even those people to whom uh, writing comes easy, it comes in, in spurts, you know. It comes in fits and starts. And when I say it comes in fits and starts, which means you, you, you have this block getting. And writer's block your, is, is simply your inability to go ahead with your writing. This is why I said that if you are a writer, you can sit down and write with with, uh, with, with beautiful flow from the beginning to the, to the end. It's great. The outline technique I have spoken to you is especially meant to help students like you. It will help you a lot. 
the problem with thesis, PhD thesis writers often is that they often ignore that aspect because they think it is beneath them. Paragraph writing is, is, is kind of beneath them. Uh, they normally look for the probably the wood and the, the trees in the process. That's what happens to them. Academic writing in Calicut University, we are teaching it at, a, at the UG level, and they're teaching in detail the paragraph structures, topic sentence, all these things. So what you can do is, if you're writing a thesis, break it down into chapters and decide in advance what will each chapter deal with. Right? If you're talking about uh, imagery in emulatic insert, right? treatment of imagery in emulatic insert, then decide. Are you going to uh, divide your thesis according to the different types of imagery she uses? Or are you going to uh, group it thematically, imagery related to death or imagery uh, related to uh, 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 stress and grief, imagery related to love? Uh, are you going to categorize it like that? So one, two, three, you have three chapters. Again, decide in each chapter what will I look into. When you do that, as I said earlier, you are doing incremental writing. In one paragraph, you are talking about treatment of uh, death uh, using the imagery of a journey in this poem, then the imagery of a journey in another poem, then the imagery of journey in a third poem. So this is how you are dealing with it. So you are breaking down the job into small, really brick-like units. That will help you incremental uh, writing. So what I said is equally relevant, sometimes more relevant to a degree PhD student, because uh, you might be worried about your writing and you may take it seriously. But uh, often, to be honest, uh, I've seen, uh, if not often, occasionally, uh, this is writers, PhD thesis writers, uh, may not. I hope I have answered your question. Thank you. Anya. Now, uh, Husna Amin's so, question. Yeah. Yes, somebody was saying something. Sir, uh, uh, what do you think is the ideal length of a paragraph? Or when can we say that a paragraph is too lengthy? Uh, how long is too long? Uh, Priya is asking. Yes, sir. <laughs> See, uh, I told you that uh, a research article I got in which one para was three sentences. If you have a paragraph with three sentences, which means the topic sentence is never sufficiently expanded, explained with supporting uh, details. There is no mathematical precision to an ideal paragraph, the length of an ideal paragraph. But I would, I would say that a good paragraph, again, when I say sentences, certain sentences will be short and certain sentences would be long. So a good paragraph will have uh, often, I would say like uh, eight to 10 sentences, but don't take me too seriously, right? There's nothing like uh, a number to, to fix it. You have a topic sentence, and you are explaining it with supporting uh, details. You will explain it with a couple of sentences. Maybe you'll use that sentence or two to give details and examples for that. And then you will conclude uh, at the end. A, a, I would say if you're talking about an uh, A4 uh, sheet of paper, I would say uh, if you're talking about a decent uh, double spaced, there may be three paragraphs or two good paragraphs and a half kind of thing on a sheet, a sheet of paper. But that is, don't take my word as unbreakable, right? Two short paragraphs often give the message that you haven't really worked it out at length. That you haven't studied, you haven't done your homework, so your paragraph is not long enough. 
right? Two long paragraphs is that you haven't really succeeded in understanding the concept. That is why you are verbose, writing too long and too much about it. This is why you need to pitch it kind of middle, not too short, not uh, too, too long. I uh, hope that will help, Priya. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Then Husna, I mean, uh, do you know any good academic writing courses, helpful for research, uh, scholar? Uh, I'm not very familiar with courses like that, but I think on Coursera and all, uh, I have come across uh, <clears throat> uh, courses like that. I do not know whether any, any university is running an academic program, but this is much, much uh, needed focusing on writing. So any, any of you can suggest your colleges, your departments to uh, organize uh, a lengthy, as I said, 30 hour add-on program on academic writing, completely focusing on PhD scholars. I, I cannot give you a, a concrete response at the moment. So if I come to know, I'll get back to you. I'll, I'll, I'll communicate that to Anjana. Shruti Francis is asking about division of research, working into chapters and the plan to separate research publication. Uh, self plagiarism. A uh, good question, uh, Shruti. I was talking about structuring your thesis, and uh, sometimes you have read a lot and you are not capable of using a part of your decent reading, then you will be worried about what do I do about it. And, and then I said you can turn it into another research article, but do please do not try to pad the thesis with it. Then it would make thesis fairy. That's the context in which I said that. It will not become self-plagiarism because you are cutting off a part which is not needed for your thesis, which doesn't form an integral part of your thesis. And you have to make sure that uh, this is not related. That is why we are removing it, right? You're removing uh, it because uh, it doesn't form a meaningful part of the core of your argument. That is why you are you're treating it separately. You read more about uh, Orhan Pamuk, and you have uh, read about his his uh, politics, right? Certain comments he has made politically, contemporary politics, and his disagreement with the establishment, so on and so forth, which you think do not really contribute to the. the team you are exploring, you're turning it into another article. You are not simply repeating what you have said. Self-plagiarism is actually trying to pour your arguments into a different uh, bottle, uh, restructuring uh, the paragraphs, uh, changing the order, and labeling it as fresh. That is self-plagiarism. If you're doing what I said you can do, I don't think that would amount to self plagiarism. But yeah, Tanya said it's a uh, masterpiece. Thank you. And uh, Bidit Banerjee has a question. Uh, like so throwing light on prioritizing the reading list, should there be a consistent balance in the time spent on theoretical text and, uh, and the resources? And it's commonly seen researchers begin with primary resources and spend extensive time uh, on it. Preparing a reading list is generally uh, recommended as a strategy at the beginning of your, of your research. And Western universities often, often do that. You, you prepare a reading list and you uh, go ahead, even though some editing and revising would be called for in the later uh, stages. 
And even when you prepare the reading list, you know, uh, the thesis discussion you have, an area you're exploring would help you to form a reading uh, list. It depends, it depends on your topic. So I cannot uh, specifically help you out over here. It depends on the topic you're exploring. But you are starting off a journey with an assumption at the back of your mind. And certain books may not be as useful as you thought it might be. Certain articles may not be as supportive as you wanted it to be. It's possible. So a balance between the time spent on theoretical texts and resources. Uh, again, now, Bijit, I would say it depends on the, on the thesis statement and what you're exploring. If you're exploring such as ex something which is exclusively theoretical, then you might have to spend a lot of time on theory. If your primary research question is related to a theorist, right? Then obviously you have to spend a lot of time uh, on theory. That is that is needed. Or if you are interpreting, reading, all right, marking a particular text, uh, reading it in the, in, on the basis of the, of a particular theoretician or a theory, then you need to talk about uh, the balance as such. But often what happens is, for example, they say that. If your, th your thesis is a good thesis, if it, if it has got only around 30, 35% around 30% according to some estimate of quoted material and 60 to 70% of original content, which is the comment they make when they talk about too much quotations coming into it, how you have to paraphrase, how you have to integrate quotes into it, and how you have to use real quotes there. So the balance will depend on the kind of text you have chosen and the kind of focus you have uh, for your thesis. It varies, I would, I would say, right? Uh, it's commonly seen researchers begin with primary, so spend an extensive time on it. Uh, this is a good observation uh, of which it because Often uh, we come across research articles and, and, and thesis which spend a lot of time talking about the primary text only. It would be glorified paraphrases of, of what is happening inside. Uh, extended plot lines will be, will be uh, given. The story will be retold again and which we are not really interested uh, in. And that will be reflected in the writing too. So too much time they may spend with the primary resource sometimes because they are so comfortable with it, which, which can obviously lead to an imbalance because when you join the conversation called research, you do a lot of listening to the voices which come from the other quarters, other related quarters. And it is, it is it your, your submerge, when you submerge yourself in those voices and, uh, and the echoes and the echo chamber of the voices and the lights and the cross lights, voices and the dialogues, the conversation related, for example, maybe trauma, as someone said, you begin to take in as much as you can take in. And you say that now there's something I need to say. There's something I got to say. Sometimes they say that's when you say that enough is enough. But let me say what I have to say. So too much of time spent on primary researchers and not spending uh, justifiable time on secondary materials and resources will obviously lead to the creation uh, of a thesis uh, which is well rather heavy on the primary and lacking in uh, scholarly input and support from others. Thank you for that. And Sri Narayanan spoke about the comment I have made about research question to be stated in the initial part of the thesis. What if the researcher doesn't get an answer to those questions and leave the questions unanswered? 
Uh, all right. See, if you couldn't get an answer to the uh, question, definitely that will be uh, reflected at the beginning, isn't it? You can uh, see, you create an outline based on the messy outline. You come to a structured outline. Then you can uh, create a kind uh, structure design uh, for your thesis, and then you uh, then you explore. But obviously, you are writing the thesis after you have done a lot of reading into it, and by that time, you have actually uh, come to the conclusion where it is headed. And there is, of course, a possibility that you end up somewhere else. This is related to the question they ask, like. What if, what if your findings are wrong? In social, social sciences and humanities, as far as I know, the, the research is still, still valid. So if you started out with one question, and if you, if you concluded with a different answer, that will obviously be reflected at the beginning of your uh, writing. That is what uh, I feel, Shrija. Niranjan, uh, is there any major difference between present thesis and thesis of the past in the case of number of pages, the number of books in the bibliography and the dependence and secondary books to support? Uh, See, so in my uh, good question, Niranjan, uh, in, in my uh, experience, in, 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 in terms of number of pages, even now, the, most of the thesis is, is like uh, uh, 200 plus kind of a category. All right. And relatively, I cannot say this is a uh, this is something very true in all the cases. Relatively speaking, I have felt that there is a slight reduction in the number of pages, which is fine because one should not judge a thesis by the number of pages. Solid thesis can come in, in, in less than a hundred pages. Uh, we know that. There, we, we had a very well, voluminous looking, very thick looking kind of presentations in the past. So relatively the number has come down, but still it's around 225, 250, 200. That kind, that kind, even now, 200 plus, hovering around 200 plus, uh, it is. The number of uh, books in the bibliography and uh, bibliography pages, I cannot give a consistent reply. In certain, certain uh, theses, it is it's pretty long even now. And even when we judge <clears throat> or, or, or assess the thesis, which, which uh, which come to me, uh, what you often feel uh, is that we don't have really an opportunity to uh, make sure that all these books have been read because all the books they have read or referred to may not be uh, exactly reflected. That is part of the reading which has gone into your, into your head. That's how your consciousness has expanded, right? That's how you have formed your vision and all. Uh, but Generally speaking, I think there is a reduction in number of uh, bibliography related pages too. Dependence on secondary books to support, there is a kind of decline over there, which is reflected in the thesis quality too. This is why I said, uh, <clears throat> Often, uh, you, 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 not always often, I'm talking about in the light of the thesis I have come across, uh, either for one purpose or the other purpose. I do feel that there's less of secondary uh, books read to seriously support original uh, uh, idea. That's what I have felt. Uh, this is not a blanket statement we can apply to everyone. Uh, I think Sunita Matthew is asking, can we use more than one theory in the thesis? Of course, you, you can. It depends on how you have 
uh, framed your thesis statement. Is there any order in presenting the theories in the introductory chapter? Uh, again, that would be depending uh, upon what your argument is. If you are giving equal weightage, for example, feminism, uh, psychoanalysis and clinical condition of stress disorder, maybe in a, in a, in a medical humanities related kind of a, of a thesis. If you are giving equal weightage, fine. But if you feel that the concept, uh, what do you speak about the concept of feminism is necessary for what, what you need to explain in, in, the, in the following psychoanalysis part. Or again, these two are necessary so that you can build into what you are going to say about clinical condition of stress disorder. If that is how things are, then obviously you need to follow uh, an order, I would say. Otherwise, uh, you, you, don't, you don't have to stick to any particular uh, order uh, over there. Uh, right, okay. Uh, uh, who's now Amin is talking about taking paraphrasing in a, in a thesis in dealing with the history of the field. See, uh, paraphrasing and quoting, quoting are two ways uh, in which we try to uh, reflect scholarship, in which you show the, uh, you support your arguments from scholars from outside. What is uh, sometimes when you want to uh, compress your argument from a particular uh, area, from a book and all, you try to paraphrase. If, if verbatim reproduction is called for, then you go for a, uh, a quote. It depends on the significance of the material you quote. Are you doing it as to build, build your background? Or are you going to use that material as a background to present your argument? And if you would like to compress a whole lot of an essay, in such cases, you go for uh, a paraphrasing. If it's something you want to clearly uh, reflect and give space for your thesis, and obviously you can go for go for uh, uh, quote, right? And will it be also okay if you give proper reference? You have to give proper reference, and where you show the reference depends upon how uh, how you make use of that material. Uh, I'm not getting into the uh, ethics. Ethics, I don't know whether someone else is going to talk about it. That's another uh, whole different area completely. Mention the ethics of including persons, pictures in the thesis. See, it depends on your thesis and it depends on uh, whether you have the permission. Uh, and, and, and the freedom which comes from the formation to use those photographs. Without permission, you cannot use uh, uh, photographs, cannot even use names without, without permission. Normally we seek permission from them whether to use uh, uh, names over there. And uh, multicultural narratives, again, Rehana Moore is asking, to include multicultural narratives in a thesis without being referenced to a particular country or culture, but concentrating on a topic. I don't find any problem with that. If that doesn't upset the, the logical sequence in which you are presenting yourself, and if it doesn't, uh, as I said, uh, worry the organic unity of your your thesis, your your paper. You don't have to culturally foreground uh, someone or a theory if 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 it runs in such a such a manner. That is what uh, I would I would say. Sir, there's a question from YouTube where someone okay. asks. Uh, sir, can you tell us about quotations? How many quotations can we use in a single page of a thesis? Also, please tell us about quoting words as well. Uh, all right, thank you. See, uh, 
there are no rules as such about how many quotes can be uh, used on a page and all. Uh, in, in that sense, it's not very relevant. But as I said earlier, too many quotes in a thesis or in an article definitely reduces the author's presence and you're providing an enlarged presence for others in it. So when quotes begin to dominate, you are being edged into the margins. You're being pushed into a corner. This is something you need to know. You have joined the conversation because you have something to say on the particular topic. And when you have too many quotes, you still continue to let other people dominate the conversation, which would obviously relate to the space which you can claim for your original uh, statements. This is why I spoke about a 730 kind of uh, thing somebody said, uh, how far, uh, how far, how many pages of your thesis can, can there be uh, in terms of quotation. Second, uh, second question was uh, related to uh, <clears throat> using words. See, if you are using a whole sentence in a as a quote in a paper or in a thesis, the use of that whole sentence should be justified. It is always recommended that you integrate parts of that quote into your argument. And Sir, you've muted yourself. happen yes sir now yeah so uh, did did you miss a lot maybe a sentence yeah all right okay so uh, <clears throat> when you integrate a quote use the whole sentence quote the whole sentence if you think it is necessary that you quote the whole sentence otherwise what you can do is the, the part of the sentence which you think is relevant to support your argument or the part of the sentence which is necessary to, to what is it, contest that argument, you can use it all there. This is, this is important. And can you, you uh, quote a word? You can quote terms. You can, you can, you can, you can quote uh, a phrase. It is all possible, depending on, on, on the necessity. If the contest calls for that use of that particular term uh, used by someone, for example, extreme void. I was reading an article uh, in which uh, uh, the, the Thur, a Palestinian women uh, poet, uh, she was talking about walking uh, along the streets and then uh, someone coming and uh, uh, trying to identify her, asking her, are you, are you the poet? And then asking her, uh, are, are you the person who wrote that uh, extreme poem? Extreme poem. So if, if you would like to use a particular uh, term, extreme poem, you can use that. That, that, that single, uh, those, those single coinage, couple of expressions which you think uh, would reflect what you would like to reflect, what you would want to reflect. You can do that. That is that is fine. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes, sir. I think uh, that's the end of the questions. Sure. Yeah, I would like to. I would like to uh, thank thank everyone. Also, sir, sir, may I ask a question, sir? I'm Anjana. Yes, sir. sir uh, it's a practice among many people to divide their chapters, thesis chapters after the, the degree has been awarded. They divide their thesis chapters into different articles. Is it acceptable? What, are, what is your take on that, sir? 
See, right. if the thesis, the whole thesis has already been published, then uh, if it has been published, then you cannot split it down. No, no not to, published, unpublished, unpublished thesis. If it's unpublished thesis, uh, I, I know the practice you are talking about. It, it can be done if you're doing it as such. All right, if you're taking a chapter, uh, all right, and part of the chapter gets published as an article. To the best of my knowledge, there cannot be a problem with that because sometimes they even indicate that this, this forms a part of my doctoral uh, research. But what uh, I find troubling can be that you, you uh, make a lot of changes in it, right? You take part of it. Maybe you take 60 percentage of that. And uh, one thesis can lead to 10 papers or something like that. That is a problem. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, that's Thank not you. what I meant. Yeah, okay, okay, right. Thank you. So before I wind up, I would like to thank everyone and thank uh, Anjana Usguen for an opportunity and Kairali who been helping me out set up the Microsoft team and everything. Uh, thank you for pushing me into it so that I will be exploring uh, more about it in the future. It, it looks quite good. And uh, <clears throat> also <clears throat> for letting me talk about this particular topic because uh, People may not take it as serious as theory is quite serious, right? Uh, uh, <clears throat> and when you come to the mechanics of writing, often we push into, into the margins and uh, the kind of importance you give to margins when you talk about margin or the like the margin writing back, right? Uh, that, or when you talk about the structurality of structure and uh, kind of thing. You may not give that much significance to the way you, you compose the structure of a of a, of a thesis. I would say it's it's quite important that you spend quality time on that. This is why I deliberately decided to work on this kind of, as I said earlier, apparently light kind of a topic. Uh, thank you, Shishankara College and AQAC and the organizers. Thank you. Thank you sir. So it was very informative. And in the earlier times, before the internet came in, there was a practice of preparing cards. The cards yes. and we would arrange it. But once computer and internet came in, that has actually become obsolete. So initially, that was how it was done. I, I'm sure you, you you must be remembering that. Yeah, sure. Was, you, had, you had a bunch of huge bunch of cards yeah, yes, yes, arranged yes. in the proper order. It was wonderful. Uh, Anjana, the advantage of that one was that it, it lent a clear order, structure I'm yes, talking about, yes, yes. To, to things. Now we have an inherent faith in our capacity to write automatically, orderly. We think that we write and an order will form on its own. Yes, uh, you, you can put your published article on your blog, but you have to say that this was published on such and such, uh, on such and such a journal, right? Acknowledge that. Acknowledging it, you can. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, with this session, we conclude our research methodology and academic writing series. I am here to propose uh, the vote of thanks on behalf of the Research and Postgraduate Department of English, Sri Shankara College, Kaledi. Uh, there is an African proverb uh, that goes, it takes a village to raise a child, which I feel is quite applicable here for this lecture series. Um, and therefore, please bear with me as I will be taking a bit of your valuable time while I thank a lot of people who have worked behind the scenes to make this series a wonderful success. Um, I must start by extending my thanks to the management uh, of Sri Shankar College uh, for the encouragement and support given to us in conducting our department programs. Uh, we are grateful uh, to Dr. E. Suresh, the principal of our college, 
uh, for all the institutional support that he renders us. Thank you, sir. He's not here, but uh, let me do it virtually. I would like to uh, also place on record my gratitude to IQAC, Sri Shankara College, Kaledi, for jointly organizing this program with us. And I must uh, mention our deep sense of appreciation for all the resource uh, persons that have been with us through, over the course of these, uh, this series, uh, starting with Professor Joseph A. Dorairaj, who spoke on the topic Navigating Issues of Research. Uh, we then had Dr. Priya uh, Nair, who dwelt on research and literature and interdisciplinary approach. Uh, Dr. Kunya Ahmed yesterday gave us a view of uh, the philosophy, ethics, and the fundamentals of research. And today, Dr. Babu spoke to us about goal as a tool, structuring uh, a thesis, which took us through the basics of structuring a thesis in the most lucid manner. Uh, we, are, uh, we were indeed so fortunate to have an amazing panel of resource persons uh, the experience and valuable insights uh, will certainly help uh, all of us. While you all saw their ac academic brilliance uh, on screen in front of you, I was fortunate uh, to interact with four wonderful people. And thank you once again, sir. Uh, I must not forget to thank Dr. Anjana Shankar, the head of the Department of Sri Shankara College, Kaledi, who has been the mainstay of this program. It was her untiring efforts and numerous discussions with the resource people that gave us an opportunity to conduct this lecture series. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, special thanks to Prasad, sir, IQAC member and faculty, uh, and, uh, faculty in the Department of Economics for all the technical support provided, which included the YouTube live streaming. Um, he, he was very patient with me and uh, answered every small doubt I had about the platform uh, and including the doubts that the resource people had. I would like to acknowledge uh, the contribution of Sneha and Swati, research scholars in our department, for helping with the coordination of this program, especially in the creation of registration forms, WhatsApp groups, feedback forms, and the generation of certificates, which you all will, all the participants will be soon getting. I would also like to thank um, Akhil, uh, a second year stu history student for designing and creating the brochure and certificate for this lecture series. Um, I'm grateful to all the research scholars of our department for helping me for all the four lecture, uh, lectures in the series. Uh, Mincy, Anupa, Shruti, Srija, many thanks to all of you all. I would like to um, also thank uh, the faculty of my department for their constant enthusiasm and support in uh, this uh, lecture series and coming up with these uh, topics. Uh, I must uh, especially thank Sri Devi, uh, faculty department member in the Department of English, for helping me with moderating a uh, couple of sessions. And uh, in the end, last but not definitely not the least, I would like to thank all the participants of this program for their presence and the insightful questions. Um, I don't know any of the 800 plus participants who registered uh, for the series from all over India, but I am certainly humbled by the lovely words that many of you all have sent me personally regarding the program. Thank you everyone once again. I will be sharing the feedback link on the chat box and in the WhatsApp groups. Please do give us your valuable feedback. Thank you.